This two inch thick steel box is fireproof, bomb proof, even earthquake proof. But is it thermite proof? Just light the touch paper and off we go. The reaction begins. A concentrated eruption of molten metal lays siege to the safe's outer skin. The white hot thermite eats its way through the safe's two inches of steel protection before flooding inside and blowing open the doors in an outrush of superheated air. And neither are its contents. The Brainiac's £1.74, now a worthless blob of hot metal. Welcome to topic 9, redox processes. This is the first lesson, 9.1 oxidation reduction, and these would be objectives for the lesson. First of all, redox calculations. First of all, let's look at how what the definition of oxidation is. I think of oxidation as O2 minus, which is very electronegative, uh, the gain of oxygen. Uh, this is what oxygen wants to do, it wants to gain a full electron shell. So effectively, what it wants to do is it wants to grab some electrons and join to it. And so when you're being oxidized, definition ox, oxida, oxidization means you're gaining oxygen. So what you're also looking at, uh, the opposite of that is losing hydrogen. Now reduction is a sense of losing something. So when you would basically get the hematite, the various metal ions, and you'd burn them with carbon, with wood, and you'd get the carbon dioxide coming off, this would actually decrease in mass, so it'd be reduced and you'd get your liquid metal coming off. So that's the that's where the loss of the oxygen comes in. And as the opposite is concerned, if you've lost oxygen, it was originally pulling these, these electrons away, and so it will give those electrons back. And so it's the gain of electrons, as opposed to oxygen, it's the loss of electrons. Here we have the more precise terms, uh, accounting of the electrons. Uh, as I mentioned before, oxidation is the loss of electrons. Some people like to use uh, these ways to rem remember them and reduction is the gain of electrons. I really don't like those, I'll put those up there because they're very common, but I like to think about sort of the more chemical, the realities of what's going on to know how, whether it's gaining or losing electrons. So that's where the word redox comes from. The oxidization agent causes oxidization and so it itself is reduced. The reducing agent causes, causes reduction, so it, it itself is oxidized. So don't forget those terms. So let's practice those. Have a guess at what you think these ones are. Stop the video uh, and then we'll have a look at it. Classically, we can simply look at these the hydrogen oxygens in most of these. Uh, and so what you've had here, there's no, there's nothing there, so that's not going to help you. This one here is lost oxygen. Uh, so we could say it's reduced because of that reason. Uh, if once we know that one's reduced, the other one must be oxidized. Uh, this one here is lost oxygen, so that must be reduced. And that one must be oxidized. Same with this one here is a ratio. That's the same. So I would say these two are the trickiest, these these two here, and these are rather simple. And so we need to go to the more precise definition. What's it done with the electrons here? This one has lost electrons over here, it's become positive. So this one must be oxidized. Uh, this one here has uh, gained electrons to lose that positive and so that one must be reduced. Uh, the same would go for here. I've just done it the easy way. Uh, that if that one's reduced, this one must have been oxidized. And here, we'll just go for the easy one. This one's become negative. That means it's gained electrons. That must be reduced. Uh, so this one must be oxidized. Now we'll use oxidation numbers in a second, but this is just using the definitions we've learned so far. Let's see if we're correct. Oxidized, so it's the reducing agent. Yes, yes, and yes. All right. Now it is helpful and actually essential in various other topics to know what some oxidizing and reducing agents are. In particular, these ones in organic chemistry, you're going to have to know them as oxidizing agents. They get reduced, uh, but also be aware of obviously oxygen uh, is an oxidizing agent, hydrogen is a reducing agent. Uh, but there are some other things here to look at as well. Moving on to oxidation states. This is just a mathematical trick that we use to keep track of where the electrons are. These are some examples of what the oxidation states are. First rule, which we'll come to in a second, is if it's in its normal state, it's zero. If it has a charge, the charge is the oxidation state or the oxidation number. Uh, and so if you're looking at this, 
uh, you can just look up here and it will tell you what the oxidation numbers are. So these are the rules that we need to determine the oxidation numbers or oxidation states. Uh, as we said, things in their normal state are zero. Uh, if you add up all of the parts of a polyatomic ion, such as SO4, 2 minus, the overall charge of the whole thing is 2 minus. Alkali metals uh, are always plus 1. Fluorine is always minus 1. Uh, generally, you can look at the periodic table for their ionic charge. That will give you a clue. That will be usually be the oxidation number or oxidation state. Group 2 is 2 plus. If you confuse with transition metals, doesn't tell you in Roman numerals. Just go for plus 2. Hydrogen is a little bit tricky because it uh, should be plus 1. Uh, but if it's a hydride uh, such as this, uh, then it's minus 1 because sodium uh, will be plus. Oxygen minus 2, uh, just remember the exception H2O2 where it's minus 1 and a halogen is always minus 1 just like it is in group 7. So particular attention to these ones in red because uh, IB just likes to test you on exceptions sometimes um, and so don't get fooled by those two. So here is an example of how to do it in molecules. Uh, so here we have hydrogen it's a neutral charge, uh, and so both are zero. Uh, both my setups are zero. Both are zero. That's in its natural state. Carb uh, CO2, as we learnt before, this is always minus two. So if there's two of those, that must be minus four. Uh, so the carbon must be plus four. Here's a whole range of other compounds here. You can pause the video and have a look and uh, practice those. Just a reminder, if you haven't covered this before, the transition metals usually give you these numbers here. Uh, so this one's a 4, so you'll know that it's 4+. plus. Uh, and so for magnesium dioxide, uh, you know this is negative 2 anyway times by 2, so this will be a plus 4 anyway, but they just make it clearer using those states. And just to name them, make sure you don't forget to put those Roman numerals in there as well. Now that we know how to work out what the oxidation state or oxidation number is, remember that an increase in oxidation state is it oxidized and reduction, reduction in oxidation state oxidation number is it, is it reduced. One thing also to mention is uh, the charge is always has the plus after it whereas the oxidation number state is the plus is before. Um, so what we have here uh, this is an increase oxidation uh, this has gone from plus to negative so that's a decrease that's reduction. So have a look through any of those pause the video and see whether they make sense or not. Next we're going to learn how to balance redox reactions uh, so I've simplified it here. First make sure that the thing that's been oxidized or reduced is about the atoms are balanced. Then write the oxidation states. Uh, use those oxidation states to balance the number of electrons because that's that's keeping track of the electrons transfers. But once you've done that, have a look at the negativity and make sure all the, the charges are, are balanced out uh, with H pluses. And finally, make sure the atoms are balanced out because the H plus is using water. So this is the first problem. Balance the half fraction of iron being oxidized to iron 3. Iron 2 to iron 3. So if you write out the atoms, that's nicely balanced already. Uh, the oxidation states are, are the same there. Uh, that's uh, written out with should have a plus at the front. And then you can see that there is it's a plus 2 to a plus 3. So we need to add one electron. And that quite simply gives us the balanced half reaction. Problem 2, permanganate, reduced to manganese iron in a acidic solution. Uh, so the ions are already balanced, the atoms are already balanced out. The oxidation number again, plus 7 uh, to plus 2, putting the plus first. Uh, that helps us to balance out the electrons, so we need to put an extra 5 electrons on the left hand side. That now requires us to balance out the charges, so there are 5 electrons plus 1 electron, which is 6 electrons but there's two plus on the other side uh, and so that makes it a, a total disbalance of eight. So I need to put eight H pluses on the left hand side and then we need to put four waters on the other side to balance out all the hydrogens and then finally we get our balanced half reaction. Problem three, dichromate. Uh, we need to add an extra atom this, side, this time on the right hand side. Uh, then we do the oxidation numbers plus six to plus three. Now there's a total of 
plus 12, plus 6 on the right hand side and plus 12 on the other side. So I need to add 6 electrons to balance out the number of electrons and then to balance out the charges the chromates minus 2, the 6 electrons, that makes a total of minus 8. So to get from minus 8 to plus 6 we had to add 14 pluses to balance the charges out and then 7 H2O's on the right hand side to balance out the hydrogens that we've added and that gives us the finished half reaction. Now that we've balanced out both half reactions we can add these two half reactions to get our full reaction, our redox reaction. Uh, so write out the two half equations, that was the work that we just did. Uh, multiply both sides of the electrons can cancel out and then we can simply just add them together just like Hess. So here we have the problem, the balance of reaction between the manganate and the iron ion and we can see the manganate ion is plus 1.5 and the iron ion is plus 0.7. Now this is, this is high level uh, using these tables but uh, it's useful for you to know this in standard level to double check your work. So the most positive one is the one that's going to work the less positive one gets reversed. So turn the iron around. So here we have oxidation of the iron and, and reduction of the manganate. And so now we're balancing the charges. So there's five electrons on both. Uh, now that we've done that, cancel out the first one. We're going to add the two together, cancel out the ions, and then we add those, those two reactions together to get our final balanced reaction. Moving on to titration calculations now. Titration calculations work by having some sort of chemical that will change colour when you have a change in, in the oxidation state, uh, usually with adding uh, changing the pH. So here we have the, the manganate ion that's purple, uh, and then it reacts uh, with the acid here, and then it becomes colourless. Another common titration reaction is using iodine and thiosulfate. The iodine is in the potassium iodide form and it can be oxidized with these uh, oxidizing agents. And so what you can have is because iodine is a, a sort of a brownie color uh, that it will go from a, a, a clear to a brown color. Uh, and once it, once it becomes this iodine color it can react with thiosulfate uh, which will make it clear. Here it is with starch, it becomes blue black. Once you've got to that stage you can then change it to a clear color. Uh, just a little added extra here, we have um, two ways of dealing with iodine. So can you make sure you've got your reactions very really clear uh, before you start your titration. So iodometry and iodimetry they are both using iodine but can be used in completely opposite ways. One can be reducing the ox the iodine, one can be oxidizing it. You can go from clear to brown or brown to clear based, based on what you're analyzing. Going on to the Winkler method now. The Winkler method determines the amount of oxygen that's dissolved in water. So if you completely oxidize water by shaking it with air, uh, as you can see here with the Winkler method, uh, that gives you a complete saturation of nine parts per million. All right, so what you normally have in healthy water is somewhere less than nine, because nine is the maximum. So here you have nine uh, grams per liter. That's where you get your factor of a million from, nine parts per million. Just as a reference value, it needs to be at least three uh, for most fish species, dissolved oxygen. And what we're doing here is we're grabbing the water from a sample, a river or so forth and we're letting it sit for five days at 20 degrees Celsius. They're the standard conditions that we're using and in that time there is uh, various organic material if it's polluted and the bacteria and so forth will break down that organic material and in the process of that respiration the, the oxygen level will decrease. So in that situation after the five days we'll measure the amount of oxygen using the Winkler method and that will then be called the BOD, the biological oxygen demand. Now if you just took your water sample and you left it for five days and it went from uh, let's assume the maximum possible value of nine uh, right down to zero, the only thing that you'd be able to say is, is it, the BOD is a nine uh, so you'd only be able to really measure from here and say, well, it went to zero. Uh, let's say it didn't, it didn't change at all, just, um, just went to eight. Uh, if it did that, then you'd say that the water was very clean. If it went to zero, well, and well, at best you could say it's unacceptable quality. So how do you get these massive numbers here? Well, you'll have to take this water sample out here and you'll have to do various dilutions. Uh, so one in a thousand uh, dilution. And if that decreased, uh, down to a very small number, 
uh, 50 or something equals 0 or whatever, you could then say, uh, you could then do the math and multiply it out and say that the bio and work out that the biological oxygen demand of that particular sample is extremely high. You dilute it out quite a lot and it still had enough organic waste in there to reduce it down from 9 to, to some other number. So dilution is absolutely essential if you've got very polluted water to work out how much oxygen is required. So here's the actual Winkler method. You need to be familiar with what's going on at each stage. Uh, as I'd mentioned before, you work out uh, the saturated, all right, so you, you mix it up uh, with oxygen uh, and test that, test your method out. Uh, you then uh, let it sit for five days and various, have various dilutions. Okay, so the first thing you do is you add the manganese iron. The manganese iron will bind with the oxygen and will fix it. Uh, and so then you can just leave it uh, in the solution there and take it back to the lab to analyze later. When you're back at the lab, you can then release that release that bound manganese. Uh, so then you add the iodine and water and then reform that manganese. So any oxygen that was bound to that will now be converted directly into iodine. So that you can then grab, uh, titrate the amount of iodine that was formed from the manganese oxide and that will tell you the amount of oxygen that was present. So we re react that with thiosulfate so that's a, a brown color it goes to clear as you can see here and then if you look at uh, you work back with all the stoichiometry ratios basically for every mole of thiosulfate a quarter of a mole of, of O2 is used up so you use a one to four ratio and that's how you work out how much oxygen remains in your container